Good evening, friends, and welcome. My name is Will Ed Green. I'm an associate pastor here at the church. I want to invite you, if you are here in our sanctuary, to go ahead and find your way to a seat. I want to welcome you if you're joining us online. As we recognize Native American Heritage Month in November, I want to begin tonight by recognizing that our gathering takes place on the sacred, traditional, and unceded lands of the Anacostum, Massawamak, Susquehannock, Piscataway, and Pamunkey peoples, who were forcibly removed from these lands to allow for English settlement. As occupiers of their territory, we recognize them as the original and perpetual stewards of this land and acknowledge our responsibility for a more honest recounting of our history that is truly anti-colonial and anti-racist, doing our work so that all people who call this place home can thrive. The William Master and Vivian T. Kirk Symposium Series was launched in 2019 in honor and memory of Dr. William Astor Kirk and his wife, who together were tireless workers for justice and inclusion, empowering communities through education and advocacy to address systemic inequality and injustice for the sake of building and becoming what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called beloved community. This symposium is just one of the ways that we here at Foundry are committed to continuing that work, equipping, educating, and empowering our community and city to address the critical questions that arise at the intersections of faith and public life. I want to offer just a few gathering pieces of information for us. American Sign Language Interpretation is available, of course, here in our sanctuary. If you are joining us online tonight, you can go to foundryumc.org forward slash ASL, and you'll find a separate stream there for your use. We will be recording tonight's presentation, so if you are joining us online and want to go back and watch again at any point, or if you have a friend that you wish were here that you'd like to share it with later on, that will be posted on Foundry's Facebook page and YouTube page. We hope that you will share that as a gift and resource for our community. And finally, if you're joining us online via Facebook, there is an option for you a little bit later in tonight's presentation to submit questions that uh, our presenters will be responding to. So we want to encourage you to do that in the comments throughout the lecture by typing the word question with a colon so we know what you're trying to do, and we'll make sure that that gets shared a little bit later. Friends, that's all of the gathering business I have to do, and I want to welcome our senior pastor, the Reverend Ginger Gaines Sorelli, to get us started this evening. Thank you, Pastor Will, and welcome everyone who's gathered here in our space at Foundry United Methodist Church and all of those who are joining us online or who will come to share in this in the days, weeks, and even months ahead. We're hoping that what we are able to offer tonight will be a resource for many, many, many people and are so glad that we are privileged to be present here together tonight in all the ways that we're gathering. I wanna take a few moments to say welcome to all of you and also to add a special welcome to our ministry partners, especially those persons who have been participating with us uh, in community in various parts of our connection as we read together this uh, book, this extraordinary narrative history, Chocolate City. Our partners at Asbury United Methodist Church, our partners at John Wesley AME Zion Church, and our partners at Edlovich DC JCC, and especially want to welcome the leaders that are present with us from those congregations. We're so glad that you have come to share with us tonight. It's an honor to be on this journey together with you. I also want to take a moment to say thank you, especially, you've already met Pastor Will, um, Will Ed Green here at Foundry, and um, partner Sonia Weibert from the DCJCC, who have been working very, very diligently to create a reading and study guide for the book. And a special thanks to you um, for all of your hard work and hours of uh, care to that project. I also want to say thank you to the Foundry Discipleship Ministries team, the Sacred Resistance Ministry team, and the full staff of Foundry Church, um, Reverend Ben Roberts, who helped bring all of this to us in the beginning, um, and all of those partners through the staff and lay leadership of Foundry who have helped us experience this together tonight. And with that, I'm gonna share the last thing that I'll share before introducing our guest speakers. Every time we gather in this space, one of the things that we're proud to offer 
is a welcome, which also says something about who we believe we are and who we believe our creator is. And that welcome is this, that no matter where you've come from tonight, no matter where you go at the close of this time together, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you feel or don't feel tonight, no matter your immigration status, no matter whom you love, you're welcome to come into this place just as you are, to be met by God who knows you by name and who loves you and who wants to have an ever closer relationship with you. On behalf of all of the Foundry staff and congregation, welcome, we're so glad you're here. And it's my honor tonight to introduce our guest speakers, the authors of the book that we are here um, to share tonight. Dr. Chris Myers Ash is a native of Washington, D.C. Uh, Chris teaches history at Colby College and serves as the editor of Washington History Magazine. He taught with Teach for America in rural Mississippi and co-founded the Sunflower County Freedom Project. He earned his PhD from the University of North Carolina and is the author of The Senator and the Sharecropper, The Freedom Struggles of James O. Eastland and Fannie Lou Hamer. His latest book is, of course, Chocolate City, Race and Democracy in the Nation's Capital, that he wrote together with his colleague, Derek Musgrove. Chris and his wife have three children. Dr. George Derek Musgrove is associate professor uh, in post-World War II United States history with an emphasis on African-American politics at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is the author of Rumor, Repression, and Racial Politics, How the Harassment of Black Elected Officials Shaped Post-Civil Rights America, and co-author of the book Chocolate City. His latest project is Black Power in Washington, D.C., which is a web-based map of black power activism in the nation's capital between 1961 and 1998. His work has appeared in the Washington Post, on National Public Radio, the New York Times, and The Root. He's currently working on a book project tentatively titled, We Must Take to the Streets Again, The Black Power Resurgence in Conservative America, 1980 to 97, which explores the burst of black activism that rose in opposition to the urban crisis and the conservative retrenchment. He earned his PhD from New York University and now lives with his wife and two sons right here in Washington, D.C. We have esteemed, esteemed scholars and partners in this work present with us to teach us and guide us. What a privilege it is to welcome both of you into this Foundry space. Can we welcome them together? Well, thank you very much for that, that warm welcome. Uh, and we're going to start off with some stories, because in the end, we, we are storytellers. And so Chris is going to get us going here. Yes, and we can, we can, we can shed our mask, at least for, for a little bit. Uh, thank you all for welcoming us to this, this beautiful space. Uh, it really is an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary sanctuary here. Thank you all for, for having us. Um, I want to start with a story from the Civil War. And uh, going back to the, the early days of the Civil War, 1862, May 1862. Uh, and of course, if you know your timeline, right, that's, that's, that's very early in the war. It's not clear who's going to win yet. The outcome is very much in doubt. And of course, D.C. is the capital of the Union Army in the Union. And there's a, a young man, a young city leader named Alexander Shepard. And he's one of, the, one of the most successful businessmen in the city. He serves on the, the board of aldermen. He's a, an avowed unionist, as pretty much all the, the white leadership in the city was at that time. They were very unionist, but they were not emancipationists. And two weeks before, Congress had passed the Emancipation Bill and had, had emancipated the enslaved people, more than 3,000 enslaved people in D.C., April 16th, of course, we honor with Emancipation Day as a holiday to this day. Uh, and Alexander Shepard and the rest of the white leadership in town was not happy with emancipation. But it had been done, Congress had done it, and it, it, was, it was a fait accompli. Two weeks later, 
Shepard says, okay. And he's talking to the local paper and he says, I hope now that the discussion of the Negro question in this city is at an end. I remind you, this is two weeks after emancipation. This is only in DC. This is nine months before the Emancipation Proclamation takes effect. This is three years before the end of, of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment to officially end slavery. This is before Reconstruction, before any of this. And he's done. Shepard's done with talking about race because he thinks we did it, right? We got emancipation, the slaves are freed, we're done. And, and I tell this story because I think it's, it's how a lot of Americans, particularly white Americans, think about race. We like to think of it as, as something, you, you know, a problem you gotta deal with, and, and, and once you deal with it, we're, we, we're done. We don't, we don't wanna have to deal with it anymore, right? And for some people, like Shepard, you know, that was DC emancipation, that was it. We should be done with it, right? Let's go on to the real issues, which for him meant economic growth in the city. And uh, you know, for other people, it was the end of the Civil War, or it was Reconstruction, or maybe it was the Civil Rights Movement, or the election of Barack Obama. But at some point, they say, okay, we're done, aren't we? And the truth is, we're not done. We, we, we can't try to shut ourselves off and pretend as if these racial issues have been, have been reconciled forever. They weren't reconciled in 1862. They weren't reconciled with the inauguration of Barack Obama. And we certainly know after, after the last four or five years that we are not done with them yet today. So that, that's the story I like to start with because it reminds us that, that race really matters. Race is a central fault line in DC history and we can't just wish it away. Now, lest we begin with a story that makes you think that this desire to wish race and racial inequality away is the exclusive property of white DC residents, I wanna fast forward about 150 years to 2006 and tell you a different story about a different leading uh, DC political figure, and that's Adrian Fenty. Um, so picture the scene if you would, uh, Harry Jaffe, uh, you know, longtime DC political reporter, still around now doing wonderful work. And he's jumping in the little smart car that Adrian Fenty used to drive around when he was a councilman. And he's trying to talk to the, the councilman as he's running for mayor and doing a wonderful job, knocking on half the doors in the entire city. It was really a remarkable campaign. Um, and he's needling him, he's asking him the question over and over. What do you think about racial issues? Race has been at the center of DC politics for years and years. I know, I'm on the beat. Tell me what you think about it. And Adrian Fenty would constantly push him off and constantly refuse to answer the question. And finally, uh, he just got tired of Jaffe asking him so many times. Uh, and he said, look, I don't think people really want to talk about race in this city. They just want the same services in every neighborhood uh, that they get in the neighborhoods to get the best service. And so if I can make sure that in Ward 8 there's great services just like there are in Ward 3, nobody will want to talk about race. And Harry Jaffe was gobsmacked. He's like, you can't be serious, young man. Uh, this is a city where Mary and Barry just got back on the city council. He was your, you know, he was, he was literally your colleague. This is a city that less than 10 years ago had Mary and Barry as mayor. Right? And, and yet, this is a city that's constantly talking about race. And here you're saying that if you just make sure that everybody gets the same services, no one will want to talk about race. I find that hard to believe. And Adrian Venti stuck to his guns. He kept that message the entire time uh, that, that he ran the campaign. And he won resoundingly. He actually did something that no one had ever done in this city's history before in a citywide office. He won every ward. In fact, he won every precinct. It was a remarkable achievement. Um, but he continued to govern the exact same way he uh, attempted to run his campaign. And so he studiously ignored issues of race. And what a lot of black DC residents came to believe, and I, here I'm, I'm paraphrasing Lawrence Guyot, the famous civil rights activist who, who relocated to the city and became a, 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 a local political and an ANC commissioner. He said, look, we feel, African-Americans feel, uh, like uh, Adrian Fenty treats white DC residents with deference and black DC residents with diffidence. Uh, we absolutely don't believe that he's focused on making sure that we get those equal resources uh, that he keeps talking about. 
And so going into 2010, even though Adrian Fenty had a several million dollar lead when it came to fundraising over his black opponent, 80% um, of black DC residents voted against him. Black women, it was actually a little higher than that because uh, he had actually snubbed Dorothy Height. You never snubbed Dorothy Height. Um, and he lost in 2010 uh, to a relatively bland politico who had been around for a while, Vincent Gray, right? Um, now, we, we could talk about the, the, the sort of the illegal activity in that, that election, but nonetheless, nobody knew about that at the time. I mean, he lost because he lost the black vote. Um, and so what we see there is that Adrian Fenty was part of a generation of young uh, black politicos who had sort of labeled themselves post-racial, who had termed themselves new black leadership, and who believed that they could run in a sort of post-racial manner, not focus on, on racial issues. And as Chris pointed out, as they tried to walk away from race, as they tried to sort of wish it away, it consumed them, uh, and it consumed Adrian Fenty's young career. Um, so, And those are the kinds of issues that we talk about in the book Chocolate City. We talk about how, how race has played a, a, a central animating role throughout uh, DC history. And, and we want to step back a minute and talk a little bit about writing the book and, and why, why we write the book. In fact, as we were talking in the green, book, green Room, that was one of the first questions you know, folks asked me. Why did, why did you write this book? Um, I know for me, it's a, it's, um, it was a labor of love. I, I grew up in the city. Um, my, my mom lived up in, in Chevy Chase. My brother still lives in the city. It's very much my, my home. I went to Wilson High School. Uh, and, you know, I hope soon to be renamed Wilson High School and not for August Wilson, please. Uh, <laughs> it's the worst decision I've ever, I've ever encountered. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I went to, I went to Deal Junior High. And in, in, at Deal, in, when I was in ninth grade, we had to take DC history as a course. I think it's required for seniors now, but at that time it was ninth graders. And uh, on the first day, we were supposed to take a whole semester of DC history, and then the second semester was uh, world history. And I can remember the first day of class, teachers passing out the textbooks, same textbooks they still use today. Uh, and she said, I just want to let you know, we're going to go kind of quickly through DC history so we can start world history sooner. We'll be about six weeks on DC history, because DC doesn't really have much history. So we can get through it pretty quickly. Now, mind you, this is a DC public school teacher telling her DC public school students in, in a DC public school that DC history doesn't really matter. And, you know, I'm ninth grade, I don't, I don't really know. She's the teacher, okay. But, but it's kind of stuck in my head that there was something amiss about that. Uh, and I think it speaks to this larger issue that, that we face in DC, which is that DC largely does not get the respect it deserves from the nation that it serves. We just don't. People, people don't know anything about the city. I mean, I live in Maine now. I love Maine. But Mainers don't know very much about the city at all, the nation's capital. It's their nation's capital, right? It's the, the capital for, for everyone. And people don't know. They don't even know that DC residents don't have the right to vote and don't have representation in Congress. When I tell them this, I promise you, they don't believe me. They're like, no, that can't be true. I'm like, I promise you it's true. Well, didn't we fight a war about that? Yes, we did. It was a couple hundred years ago, <laughs> but we did fight a war about that, and it's still a problem. They don't even know, right? They don't know that D.C. was a slave city. That there, were, there were enslaved people by, by the thousands in the nation's capital, slave auctions happening in sight of the, of the capital. They don't know that. D.C. doesn't get respect. People don't understand the city. And this teacher didn't have respect for the city. And I kind of filed that away uh, as, I, as I grew up, became a historian, and moved back to D.C. I uh, lived for a time in Mississippi, actually in Mayor and Barry's hometown of Itabina, his birthplace, Itabina, Mississippi, lived there for a while. Came back to D.C., met Derek at UDC, uh, started teaching the D.C. history class, and I still remember that because it just irked me so much. And, you know, I guess you can see Chocolate City is a, is a very long delayed, you know, 30 years later, a long delayed response to that teacher to say, you know, you were, you were wrong. DC does have a history. It's a rich history. It's a varied history. It's a troubling history. But it's an important history, not just for DC residents, but for all the nation, because there are things that we as a nation need to learn that we can learn from the, from the experience of DC. 
So when I met Chris, I didn't know any of this. I should just point out, you know, so I'll step back. I love to point out that when we talk about how we came to write this book, you know, Chris has this sort of wonderful revenge narrative, right? It's, it's, sort of, it's sort of cinematic in that way. You know, he's wronged as a child. He goes off into the hills and trains. Then he comes back and defeats the person who, you know, wronged his family. Uh, and my approach to this book and, and to, to writing this book with Chris is really a, a sort of, a, you know, a comedy. Um, you know, I was, uh, before Chris got to UDC, about a year and a half before he got to UDC, I was teaching African-American history in, in, in post-World War II U.S. history, and I had set up my classes for one semester, and I was ready to do them, and I walk into one of the classrooms, and it's only got eight people in it. And I panicked, because I knew that we had a policy at UDC that if you had less than 10 people in the class, the class would get canceled. And I thought, oh my God, you know, like this is, this is a problem. Like I'm gonna have to teach another class that I haven't prepared for. So I run out in the hall, try to get people to come in. Nobody will do it. I have to go to my chair and say, look, I've, I, my class under enrolled, you know, so, it, so she said, fine, it's canceled. And I thought she was gonna give me another US history course, because that's typically what they do. You have to still teach a full four courses. And so she had to give me a new one. Um, and she said, well, the only course left is DC history. And I, I, I turned bright red and I could feel my heart sort of beating out of my chest. And I said, I don't know anything about DC history. Um, I had learned a little bit about it in my first book when I had sort of studied Walter Fauntroy and Marion Barry, but that was it. And she said, well, you better go home and start reading because you're teaching DC history tomorrow. Uh, and I, I I really couldn't believe this was happening. I actually tried to protest, and, and she's just like, get out of my office. You have to go learn DC history. Um, and so I had a, a, just a horrible semester, horrible semester. Uh, I was learning DC history literally hours before I was going into the classroom uh, to teach it. And my, my, my students were a bunch of jokers. There, I remember this one young man named, uh, named Pete, and uh, he, was, uh, he would come in with these conspiracy theories about how, you know, uh, Lon Font must have been a Satanist because he had sort of created a pentagram out of the roads in, in the map of DC, and of course that's not true at all. Uh, but I, he would raise this stuff in class and I would have to go home and check it, and so it was like an added amount of work uh, on top of just learning DC history. Uh, it's funny, I, I just looked online and it turns out that he's now a marijuana farmer. Uh, he, <laughs> he just had his first crop this year, and so if you've got your card, you know, look him up. Uh, but, 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 I, but this was like the crazy story that I had coming off of that first semester uh, at, um, at teaching DC history. And then I met Chris a little bit after, and I said, you know, look, man, I got this crazy story, and I ran it down to him, and he didn't laugh at all. And I'm a funny guy, right? I mean, I was really annoyed that he didn't think this was funny at all. And he, you know, we'd sort of end the conversation. He doesn't say much about it. And I, I kind of mumble something about, I really wish there was a great, you know, single volume that I could have used to prepare for class. And, uh, you know, I, I say, gosh, I wish somebody would write that book. And, and, you know, Chris goes, yeah, somebody should write that book. Um, and then that was the end of the conversation. And like a week later, I get this big fat email from him and it's a book proposal. Um, and it's, it's a survey history of race and democracy in Washington, D.C. And he said, hey, you want to write this thing together? And I said, sure. Uh, and so, you know, there it is. That's how we got to do Chocolate City. But I literally stumbled into it, whereas Chris had been stewing on this since he was 14 years old. Um, now, in the time that we have, because we don't have too much this evening, we just want to tell you sort of two additional things. Uh, uh, the, the, the first is sort of how we got the name Chocolate City, because I should just point out, um, he sends me the book proposal and, and he says, what do you want to call it? And I say, Chocolate City. And he says, sounds great. And we move on, right? But we, we want to tell you what that name really means to us and what the argument is implicit in that. Uh, and then Be we'll talk about- Before I do, I, I want to jump in and oh, sort of explain. Go ahead. Go ahead. The Chocolate City, you know, for me growing up here in the, in the 80s, like Chocolate City was just, that was just the nickname of the city. I, I didn't think you know, it was yeah. much, much of it, but I remember shortly after this conversation when, when we'd agree, you know, you know, Derek's going in, we're going to go all in on this, we're going to write this book. And I was having dinner with my wife's family out in Bethesda. And uh, I was explaining, you know, oh, Chris, what are you working on? I was like, oh, you know, this is going to be great. My friend and I, Derek, we're going to write this book on race in D.C. It's going to be called Chocolate City, and we're going to study. And my wife's cousin, 
woman in her 20s, good, liberal, uh, young white woman. You know, her face just got shocked, right? And her mouth wide, came, you know, dropped wide open. She's like, wait, wait, what are you going to call it? I said, we're going to call it Chocolate City. And she's like, but are we even allowed to say that? I was like, what do you mean? Isn't that racist? It's like, Chocolate City? Are you kidding? No. And it, and, and it had never occurred to me. But it's funny because I've gotten this reaction from, from people over and over, white people, over and over during the course of the, the We had one reviewer who was like, this is going to be a great book, but you got to change the name because that's racist. Uh, they won't, I, I'm teaching a course on race and democracy in D.C. at Colby. They won't let me call it Chocolate City because they're worried it's going to be, call, it's going to be thought of as racist, right? Because... It says a lot about the fact that something that's, that's associated with blackness is somehow considered a negative. But you know, for me, it, it never occurred to me because Chocolate City in the 1980s, it, I mean, it was, it was always considered a term of pride, like a term of joy, like a, a, a celebratory term. It was, I never interpreted it as threatening or, or somehow subversive or negative in any way. And so it hadn't occurred to me. But for many white people, they get very nervous when you start talking about blackness. They get very nervous when you start talking about race. We see this in the school board debates, you know, about, about race in the, in the public schools, right? They just, it's divisive, right? It, it's controversial. Just don't bring it up, right? It's Alexander Shepard Oliver. It's like, we're, we're done with that. We elected Barack Obama twice, right? Can't we stop? And, and it's like, no, no. And, and Chocolate City is just such a great way to capture uh, the, the spirit of, of this city. And Derek will explain why. Yeah. So, so you know, I had, I had heard about Chocolate City the same way Chris had. You know, he grew up in Chocolate City. He, he had heard people around him calling the city Chocolate City. He called it Chocolate City. And when I started coming to the city, I'm originally from, from Baltimore in the 1990s, people were still calling it such. And so uh, I just jumped in on that. But more importantly, my father was a big fan of the best funk band in the history of mankind, which of course was Parliament Funkadelic. Uh, and so if you're a P-Funk fan, you know that in 1975, they put out an album called Chocolate City. And it was quite literally a love letter to Washington, D.C. It was actually a song, its title track was about Washington, D.C. Now, P-Funk, like any great musician, did not come up with the name. They had actually heard it on the streets of Washington, D.C. Um, so roughly in about the mid-1960s, residents of D.C. began calling the city Chocolate City. Uh, local DJs on a lot of the, the local black uh, radio stations began hearing that. They started calling the city Chocolate City. And very quickly, by the, by the late 1960s, early 1970s, it kind of emerges as the city's nickname. Right, uh, widely understood as such. Um, now that nickname, as far as most of the folks who were using it were concerned, as far as P-Funk was concerned, and as far as the folks that were talking to Chris uh, and Chris himself were concerned, meant really three things, right? The first was that DC was the first major American city to have a black majority. Uh, that occurred in 1957 when the black population rose over 50%, and it was quite literally the only city uh, larger than 100,000 people in the United States of America that had a black majority, right? So it was the first. It was very exciting in that regard. And it got very black by the time we get to uh, the mid-1970s when P-Funk actually puts out their album. Uh, and so between uh, 1957 and roughly 1975, uh, the percentage of the population that's African-American goes up to roughly 73, 75 percent. Uh, so three quarters of the population is African-American. It's number one, right? Um, but look, we know from just the news that, that we've been watching in the last couple of years that a black majority doesn't necessarily make a positive chocolate city, right? If you look at Ferguson, Missouri, most people wouldn't call it a chocolate city in, the, in, in, a, in a way of celebrating it, right? And DC really had two other things that made it something to celebrate. Um, the first is that it was absolutely bursting with black culture. Um, remarkable musical impresarios like Roberta Flack was a DCPS music teacher. You can still find people walking around the city today who's like, yeah, Roberta Flack, that was my music teacher, right? She like, just taught me how to sing. And of course, she's cutting some of the most iconic albums of the late 1960s and 1970s in Mr. Henry's, a burger joint on Pennsylvania Avenue, 
right, over by Eastern Market. You, if you look at her first album, it's, it's actually shot upstairs in Mr. Henry's. People like Chuck Brown, um, a DC transplant who had been at Lorton, who learned to play the guitar there, is creating an entire new form of music right here in Washington, DC, in Go-Go, right? And you can go on and on and on. P-Funk is coming here and having these massive, remarkable shows. Um, the reason they're celebrating the city is not just because it's uh, a majority black city, but because it's one of their best fan bases in the entire country. And you can keep going. On Georgia Avenue, one of the most important black um, uh, uh, repertory companies, the Black Repertory Theater, uh, is right there at the Colony House on Georgia Avenue, right when you get to the bottom of Petworth. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting place for black culture. And then on top of all of that, it is a place where you have a tremendous amount of, of growing black self-determination. We have to remember that from the end of Reconstruction all the way until the 1960s, you can't vote for anything in DC. It's, it's, a, it's a city governed by three presidentially appointed commissioners, all but one of whom for 100 years is white. But in 1968, right around when people start calling DC Chocolate City, it gets an elected school board. In 1971, it gets a non-voting member to Congress. In 1973, Congress passes home rule legislation. And in 1975, you actually have the first home rule government, a mayor and a city council, seated as elected uh, officials for the first time since Reconstruction. And all of those people are civil rights activists, anti-poverty activists, and black power activists. Um, a supermajority of the first city council are civil rights and black power activists including some of the white members, right? And so DC is not just a majority black city and one that's, that's ruled by a large number of black folks, but it's really ruled by the movement in a, to a significant degree. And so all those things together kind of made up what goes into the term chocolate city. Uh, and it was for many people in this city something to absolutely be celebrated. And so Chris never thought that there was a negative definition for it, and rightfully so. But the problem for us writing a, a survey history of the, the whole of DC history is well, okay, Chocolate City works for that period in the late 20th century when DC has a black majority, but we're going back hundreds of years. How, do you, how does that title capture the whole of, of DC history? And we think it does because from its inception, DC has been a chocolate city in the sense that race has played a central animating role in the city's history. There's always been a large, an active black population in this city. Whether or not at a particular point in time it was a majority, as it, as it was in the late 20th century, or not, as it's not no longer a black majority now, and it was not at, the, at its inception, race and the, the presence of a large black population plays a fundamental and central role in the city's history. When you think about going back to the city's founding in 1800, we, we like to famously say in the tourist guides, we'll say, oh, it was you know, built on this swamp, in this wilderness. No such thing. This was prime plantation country. It was chosen, the location was chosen on the banks of the Potomac River rather than in Philadelphia or on the banks of the Susquehanna in, in Pennsylvania, precisely because it was plantation society. It was prime plantation land here. It was a slave society. And Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, George Washington, other Virginians and Southerners wanted to make sure that that nation's capital that they were building was gonna be safely ensconced within the slave South to protect slavery and the institution of slavery from, from what they perceived as a, a dangerous and, and fledgling uh, anti-slavery movement that had its roots in Philadelphia, which was at, at the time the other main contender. And so from the beginning, Slavery has a, has a major role to play, not only in DC history, but also in the reason why we're, we're right where we are today. And from the beginning, DC, even though it is a slave city, DC is, is a somewhat of a beacon of, of hope for black freedom. Even in the antebellum years, and this is hard for us to understand now, we might think, oh my gosh, it, you know, there, there are thousands of slaves in the city. But very early on, as DC urbanizes, the, the free black population grows relative to the enslaved population. So that by 1830, a majority of the black people in the city are actually free. And what do those free black people do? Well, they start building stuff. They start building schools for their children, private schools for their children. They have benevolent societies. They start to, to break off from white churches and build their own churches. There are free black institutions in this, in this city that don't exist else, elsewhere. 
And so if you are an enslaved person and you're on a plantation in Maryland or Virginia or the Carolinas or Delaware, and you're looking to, to get freedom, where do you go? Well, you're gonna go where there are free black people who can help you, and that's Washington, D.C. And there were, there were committed and active free black folks here. In 1813, a woman named Mina Queen, an enslaved uh, black woman, but she claims by, by virtue of her family's oral history that her ancestor, her grandparents had been free. And therefore she had been illegally re-enslaved. And she takes her case all the way up to the US Supreme Court in 1813. She loses, but there's a remarkable dissent. In that, in that case. And the, the, the dissent says, look, if we don't accept this oral history, then, then these people are doomed to perpetual slavery. But Mina Queen loses, but people keep fighting. And just less than 10 years later, a man named William Coston, who is related by blood to Martha Washington, he fights back against the new black code in the city. The, the, the city is trying to crack down because they're worried as the free black population grows, they're worried that more and more black people are gonna to wanna to move to the city and that the, the black population is gonna grow and, and, and get, in their minds, out of control. So they crack down with all these, these uh, laws against, uh, against free black people about where they can congregate and they need, uh, they need papers and they need an affidavit from white people, from three different white people and they, all these things. William Costin's like, no. I'm not going to do that. Arrest me. And they do. So they arrest him. They take him to the court. D.C. court, Judge William Cranch. He was the judge for 50 years in, in D.C. And, and William Costin makes this remarkable argument you know, a century or more ahead of his time. He says, look, the Constitution of this country should be colorblind. The laws of the Constitution should be applied equally to all races, right? equal justice before the law. That wasn't the king, you know, that was not a legal thing at the time. And he almost convinces Judge Cranch. Judge Cranch says, yes, but. And so he says, okay, William Costin, you're right. There's no way that we, I mean, your, your legal arguments are sound. Yes, the law should be applied equally. The law, you know, so you and your family won't be discriminated against. The, the laws won't apply to you and any other free black people currently living in the city. But it will apply to any other people, free black people who try to come to the city. So, so the future free black people lose, but they keep fighting. 15 years later, after another crackdown on, on free blacks in the city, Isaac Carey, a black abolitionist in the city, runs his own perfume business. And the DC uh, Board of Aldermen, in its wisdom, passes a law that says, black people can't own businesses. And Isaac Carey says, Try me. And so he keeps selling his perfume. And of course, they arrest him. And he goes and he fights back, goes back to J Judge Cranch, and he wins. Right? Even in antebellum times, DC had been a, a, a beacon of, of hope and opportunity for black America. And it continues. During the Civil War, tens of thousands of former slaves flood into the city. The black population skyrockets so that after, re after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, D.C. is on the vanguard. D.C. is on the vanguard of racial change in the country. Black men in D.C. are the first black men to vote. They, they start voting and running for office and winning. By 1869, you have a racially integrated city council with black members from every ward in the city. They passed the most racially progressive laws in the country. Basically, the 1964 Civil Rights Act that we all know and love, D.C. Council passed that in 1869, 1870. D.C. was on the, on the front lines of racial change. By the, by the end of the 1800s, by the turn of the 20th century, D.C. has the largest, most educated, most prosperous black community in the country. This is all happening long before it becomes a black majority. So we argue that D.C. has been a chocolate city from its inception. And I'm a little worried that we're, we're getting too far along in time. And so I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap it up and so we can get questions from all of you because I'm sure you, you all have them. Um, and so we'll just tell you what we, wanna, what we want folks to take away from the book. And you know, Chris usually rails on here and says, well, I want you to read the book and find what you'd, what you'd prefer to take away from it. But we nonetheless have three guideposts uh, for what you should take away from the book. Um, and so the, the first one is um, that race really is the sort of central fault line in D.C. politics and D.C. political history uh, in, the, in the roughly 400 years that we, 
study. And so you really can't understand the city's history if you don't uh, pay some pretty significant attention to the role that race plays in our politics, how we are governed, and even what our notion of democracy is. And so that's number one. And DC has always been a, a, a symbol of American democracy and, and, and a battleground, right? So, so it is the nation's capital, but a lot of the really important struggles about race don't just happen in DC, like in the halls of Congress, they happen about DC and what is happening on the streets of DC. I mean, if you think about the, the abolitionist movement, you know, the, the fight to end slavery, a lot of that was about slavery in DC for two reasons. One is it's a symbol of American democracy, Everybody is, is watching what goes on here, right? It's not Vegas, right? What happens in D.C. never stays in D.C., right? It, everybody around the world is watching what goes on in D.C., right? And so they, it's, it's symbolic. So abolitionists from the beginning said we have to end slavery in D.C. because, because it's, a, it's a stain on our nation. And we, you know, symbolically it's important for the, for the capital of a free nation to, to be a free city. But they also targeted D.C., slavery in D.C., because of strategy. Congress then, as now, has the ultimate authority over D.C. If Congress, in its wisdom, wanted to end slavery, slavery in D.C., it could do so right away without having to go through the state government of Mississippi, no arguing about states' rights or any of that business. It could end slavery immediately. And so both abolitionists and pro-slavery advocates both saw D.C. as kind of the, the, the key. William Lloyd Garrison, the famous white abolitionist, said, D.C. is the first citadel to be carried in our fight to end slavery. John C. Calhoun, famous pro-slavery senator from South Carolina, said, this is our Thermopylae. If we lose D.C., we lose it all. And so D.C. has been a battleground, whether it's slavery or the fight over school integration or, uh, or different fights that happen, uh, racial fights that happen, often happen about D.C., and, and D.C. also plays two other really important roles in, in uh, U.S. democracy writ large, right? Uh, the first is it's a stage for, for U.S. democracy. It's, it's a place where uh, the, 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 the um, temples of American democracy are actually situated. It's the place where the presidential inauguration occurs. It's a place where Congress meets. Uh, and so the, the actual pageantry of, of our democracy takes place in this city. It's, it's where it happens. Uh, but the other, uh, sort of piggybacking on what Chris says, uh, is that it's also a laboratory. And so just like people are battling over which way D.C. should go, members of Congress, because of that power that they have uh, in the Constitution of exclusive legislation over the city, are also just trying stuff out in D.C. that they may want to try elsewhere. Uh, and so sometimes that, that redounds to the citizens of D.C. Uh, in a good way, uh, like with D.C. Emancipation, which happens a couple of months before the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, sometimes uh, it, it doesn't. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, members of Congress, uh, you know, looked at D.C.'s needle exchange program in the mid-1990s and said, you know, that violates my religious principles. I'd prefer that that not happen. Uh, so they, they cut off the D.C.'s needle exchange program. And within a couple of years, we became, uh, we had the highest uh, per capita AIDS rate in the United States of America. Uh, and then, of course, Congress stretches back and, and says, OK, you guys can spend your own money on needle exchange. Um, that was just 15, 16 years ago, if some of you may remember. Um, and so, so DC ends up being the stage, this battleground in this laboratory. Now, I'll stop with this, because I know that we are over. Uh, and, and pardon me, uh, Pastor, Pastor Will, um, is that you know, one of the things that we really hope that you take away from this book, and because there, there is a lot of, of uh, there, there are a lot of very ugly stories in this book. There's, there's a great deal of injustice that we cover in this book. But what we also wrote about in this book, and what we want to just highlight for you as we close out this evening, uh, is that there are tremendous stories of people fighting on the streets of this very city, right outside those doors, right down the street, right up the street, fighting to breathe life into American democracy, to actually make it real for everyone in this country. And in some cases, even winning. Uh, and so we hope that as you read this story, you'll not only sort of see, see a warning about what we've been and what was bad about this country, but you'll also see a blueprint for what we can be uh, and what we can make of this country. Uh, and so we hope you enjoy reading it, and we hope you take those lessons and go out there uh, and change this country for the better. Thank you.
So friends, we're going to have a time for question and answer. Now I'm going to invite those who are helping move our microphones to come to the front. The way that we'll do that is there are going to be three microphones on the floor of the sanctuary. Doctors Musgrove and Ash will point out those who might wish to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, please rise as you're able and or raise a hand. If you are online, uh, we'll receive questions in person first, and then we'll move to our online community. You can go ahead and submit those questions you may have on Facebook in the comments. We encourage you to add the word question first so we know to share that with our presenters. Hello. Uh, I have a question about the last thing you were just talking about, which is um, uh, which is improving our democracy and, and having a hand in that. So given everything that you've learned about DC and elsewhere, uh, have you noticed any patterns in what kinds of activism and strategy has actually been effective? Mm. Th have we noticed any what? I'm sorry. Any patterns in Any what patterns. kinds of activism and strategy has been effective in like mm -hmm. uh, promoting and achieving equality and equity among mm. people in a community? I, well, I, I, I will take this opportunity please, to, please. to tell the highway story. Go for it. I always like the highways. <laughs> so one of my favorite topics in the book is the highways. I know it doesn't sound like the sexiest topic in the world, uh, but the highways are, are a really interesting case study in precisely that. Well, you know, what, what has been effective? And so I think about, you know, I, I used to, I went to college down south, and when my friends and I, we'd be driving home, uh, you know, you come up from the south on Highway 395, and you're flying, you know, you're going 70 miles an hour, and you, and you fly through downtown, you go right up under the Capitol where everybody got stuck during the Obama uh, inauguration. You come up, and what happens when you get to New York Avenue? You stop. There's a stoplight. And I remember when I was a college kid, I'd be like, what? Who did this? Like, who in their right mind would stop a highway, right? I, I'm trying to get home. I'm trying to zoom through the city. And they've got stop signs. And then after that, it's like, stop, light, stop, light. You know, and you're, you're, you're in the city then at that point. And I come to find out who actually did it. And it goes back to the, the 1950s. And you got to remember something about highways in the 1950s. Highways were progress embodied. Like, in the 1950s, Policymakers, urban planners, the press, everybody loved highways. And, and highways were going to be the way that DC was going to be revitalized. People talked about blight, um, you know, urban blight in the post World War II era. And like, oh, what are we going to do to, to revitalize our cities? And the answer was, we're going to build these highways. And city, city planners had these great plans for DC. All right? And we know, we know one of them. Our, our dear beltway around the, the outside of the city that we all know and love. That was part of the larger plan, but that was just the beginning. There was going to be what they called an inner loop beltway along F Street, and a nice 10 lane loop along, uh, along F Street. And then there were going to be these 10 lane highways to connect what they called the inner loop with the beltway. And then the outer loop was going to go even further out. But these huge highways were going to, were going to crisscross our city, 10 lanes. And this was inevitable. It was, it was going to happen. All, the money had been appropriated by Congress because Congress loves to dish out. In those days, we called it pork, right? All their constituents would, would get these contracts and stuff. The developers loved it because they were the ones that got the contracts, right? The unions loved it because their members got, got jobs. Uh, the press loved it because they had something to write about, and this was progress, and this was all exciting. It was a done deal. So the plans get out. This is early 1964. They land on the lap of this guy named Sammy Abbott. Sammy Abbott is a little old white guy, bald, glasses. Got to love a guy like that. Uh, I do. So Sammy Abbott looks at this plan. His wife points out, he's like, look at the, what, the, what was then called the North Central Highway. He, it's going to go right through our neighborhood. They lived in Tacoma Park, Maryland, right across the D.C. line. And there was indeed the North Central Freeway was going to go right through Brooklyn, you know, all the way up through Tacoma Park, Silver Spring, all up to connect with the, the Beltway. And... And he, Sammy Abbott's like, no, we got to stop this. Now, mind you, <laughs> Sammy Abbott, he's like a freelance artist. He doesn't have any money. He built his own house with his father-in-law. I mean, he's, he's a great guy, but he has no power at all. 
Uh, he doesn't know buddy, anybody in Congress. The money's already been appropriated. There's nothing he can do. So he starts knocking on the doors of his neighbors. And he says, look, have you seen these maps? Our neighborhood is about to get bulldozed. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. You know, what are we going to do about it? He's like, join me. And so they, they create something called the Emergency Committee on the Transportation Crisis, ECTC. This was long before we came up with cute acronyms for everything, right? ECTC. It turns out to be the mo one of the most effective social organization, protest organizations in, in the city's history. Because what he does, he doesn't just stop in his own neighborhood. He keeps following that map all the way down into DC and he gets into, into Brooklyn and these other neighborhoods. And, and who opens the door? Black people open the door. A lot of times low income black people open the door. And he tells them the same thing. He says, look, your neighborhood's gonna get bulldozed. You gotta join together across racial lines. And he knocks on the door of this young man named Reginald Booker. He's in his mid 20s. Uh, at that point, he was on the, the early wave of, of black nationalism. So he's got the dashiki. He's like 6'2. He's got the afro. He's got the dark shades. So you got Reginald Booker and Sammy Abbott, and the two of them are running EC, ECTC. And anywhere those bulldozers go, Sammy Abbott and Reginald Booker are going to be there with, their, with, with 50 people making, you know, making their lives hell. And they, they start recruiting lawyers. They go, you know, they go on the west side of the park and they start knocking on the, on the doors of lawyers saying, you've got to fight this in court. This is wrong. This is illegal. Mind you, D.C. has no vote. As Derek said, like, it's not until 1968 people could even vote for school board. There's no power. Everything is run by three commissioners. But they just keep knocking, filing lawsuits, chaining themselves to bulldozers, chaining themselves to trees, uh, jumping on tables in, at city council meetings, right? I mean, just doing whatever they could to bring attention to the fact that D.C. people did not want those highways bulldozing their neighborhoods. And they won. In 1964, when he looks at that map, those highways were inevitable. Everything, everyone who was anyone wanted those highways built. By 1972, it was impossible. Mm. They couldn't get anything done. And now we think about it 50 years later, it's unthinkable to think of 10 lane highways like paving through the city with overpasses and, and stuff. Like, it would have destroyed our city. But they did it, they stopped it. And they didn't even have the right to vote, right? But they crossed racial lines, they crossed lines of class, they crossed lines of region. We had Maryland folks working with district folks, later on bringing in Virginia folks because uh, they were worried about what was going to happen uh, across the river. And they said, don't build these highways, build a subway instead because that's something that, that regular people are going to use. And that's what they did. So that, that's one example, as Derek was talking about before, where people were able to work together. It wasn't easy but they were able to work together to create a, a more just city you know, where, where democratic voices could be heard. Thank you. Uh, the Sidwell Friends up off of Wisconsin Avenue, I understand that was a plantation do we know who owned that plantation? Mm -hmm. And the Hearst School behind mm -hmm. it is where the slaves lived. Mm -hmm. Have mm -hmm. you heard that story? I have not. No, and, but, but it, it's not surprising because again, DC was plantation country, particularly, I mean, all around. I mean, the, the rolling hills, I mean, you had tobacco fields, you had corn fields. They were worked by enslaved people. And Georgetown is a tobacco warehousing port. That's why, how it's founded. Alexandria is a tobacco warehousing port. That's how it's founded. So the earliest settlements in the, in the area, the, their purpose was simply to gather in crops from the surrounding plantations. Um, you know, up where I live in Shepherd Park, there's the old, the old Blair House, right? Uh, and so there, there's plantations dotted all over uh, parts of the district. Uh, the easiest way to find out, because uh, we have not heard that story, is that the, the, the MLK uh, Library has its Washingtoniana room. And it's got these wonderful maps of the city. Uh, and you can go back pretty far to find out who owned what land and, and, and did what on it. Uh, but I'm sorry, we don't know. One more thing. I live in Glover Park. It's right next to Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And Volta Recreation Center, right across the street, there's a little alley, little mm -hmm. alleyway. And they got these little small houses there. Um, I'm told that. A lot of the slaves lived in that alley. Mm -hmm. It's not an alleyway now, but 
those houses are so small. Oh, the, you know, the alley communities are really one of, a, one of the remarkable features of, of early DC. I mean, really, they, they last up until the, the mid 20th century, late 20th century, because the way L'Enfant had planned the cities, these grand avenues and streets laid out in this grid, they were huge blocks. And so what they would do, developers quickly realized, is like, look, <laughs> we can build houses on the front that, that front the street. And then we can build these alleys that go behind the houses and have whole communities. There will be entire communities of people living back there, cheap by jowl, often without running water, you know, in very unsanitary conditions. And sometimes there were alleys within alleys. So you might live on an alley that didn't even have a direct outlet to the street. So you had to go around to just to get out to the main road. And people living on the main road wouldn't know anything about these, these whole communities, you know, dozens and dozens of, of families living back there. They become, particularly after the Civil War, they become a uh, haven for, for incoming migrants from, from southern plantations. And so by the turn of the century, they're, they're largely black, very poor areas. But they also form these really resilient communities. Um, there's a wonderful book by James Borchard called Alley Life in Washington. Where he, where he writes about the, the, the strength of these communities. Because if you think about it, it's kind of like a modern cul-de-sac, right? So, so even when cars start to, to come in, and, and late 19th century, early 20th century streets were crowded and dirty and smelly and awful. But back in these alleys, it was like a cul-de-sac, right? Kids could play out in the yards, everybody's sitting out on the stoop, everybody knows everybody else. Uh, and so they did form these kind of neighborhood bonds. Uh, so it was a remarkable feature of, of DC, DC life. As DC it, it grows, and it, you know, especially towards the late 20th century, many of those get turned into garages or condos. You know, and they're you know they're and, they're gussied and, up. And that's actually one of the the more um, deceptive things about the alley houses that still exist. And so you can find some right off of U Street and Shaw, near like the corner of U and Ninth. You can of course find a ton in Georgetown. Many people think they're they're old uh, stables or. or, or uh, but what's happened is that they were working class housing built for poor and working class people that have since been fixed up. Uh, and so Georgetown's alley houses really got fixed up to a significant degree starting in the 1930s as Georgetown began to gentrify. Uh, and artists would go get those, those small houses and turn them into studios. Uh, and you know, like the, the artist set that would kind of hang out around uh, Eleanor Roosevelt would, would, hang, would, would live in a lot of those houses. And so what we're seeing now are sort of the remnants of uh, a solid 70 years of, of gentrification and kind of living in these places like apartments and condos and studios. Um, when people were living in them, who were, that was the only place that they could afford. And you can see these wonderful pictures in Borchert's book. Um, you can see that they're, they're, they weren't as nice then as, as many of them are now. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. I was hoping that we would be able to obtain the book here. Can you tell us where the book is available? Yes, you can obtain, obtain a book here. We're going to have a book signing right afterwards. So if we stick oh. around after 7.30. OK. Oh, uh, sorry. So, so we would definitely encourage folks to buy the book at independent bookstores. Uh, my favorite, where I do a lot of my reading and get uh, really wonderful uh, uh, um, espressos, is Sankofa up on Georgia Avenue. There's Mahogany Books uh, in, in Anacostia, which is a wonderful independent bookstore. Of course, Politics and Prose, uh, which not only has their store on Connecticut, but also, uh, I believe, still operates a bookstore at Busboys and Poets. And so we really encourage uh, folks to pick them up there. Um, but, you know, worst comes to worst, you can order it from UNC online. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We don't, we don't have any. I'm sorry. I wish I had known I put a box in the trunk. <laughs> Thank you. Understanding the racial politics, should we have expected Trump to follow Barack Obama and as we watched mm. his administration uh, and, and the changing political mix in the Senate and Congress. Was that predictable? Was it preventable? Uh, 
I, um, I, you know, certainly could be preventable. I'll, I'll let you go. I've got, I've got some thoughts on this. <laughs> so uh, you can make a good case, I think, for, for students of African American history. It's a wonderful question that, um, you know, and, and Martin Luther King says it wonderfully in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? He says, you know, look, uh, 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 sort of uh, moments of progress in the black freedom struggle are, struggle are, are typically followed by moments of backlash. Uh, and he actually wrote that book in 1967, which was dead in the middle of the, of the, the white backlash. I mean, Nina Simone wrote a great song about it that year, right? Uh, the backlash blues. Uh, and so it was, it was a phenomenon at the time. And if you go back to the Civil War, there was a backlash after the Civil War, of course, redemption, uh, as what many white Southern Democrats called it. Um, and, and so you can absolutely see this, this sort of pendulum swing in American history, where you have these moments of black assertion, uh, where, where African Americans are working with uh, white uh, liberals and moderates to gain some level of, of equality, and then there's a pretty significant backlash afterwards. Um, and so certainly if you, if you look at that model, you could make the case uh, that there was a high likelihood that there would be a backlash after uh, Barack Obama. And certainly you saw that as early as 2009 with the Tea Party insurgency. Uh, so he hadn't even really gotten comfortable in the Oval Office and boom. Um, I, I think that when it comes down to the DC level, uh, you see something very similar. Um, but what you see during the years that Obama is in office and then the transition into Trump is, is actually quite complicated, right? Um, Obama gets elected in, in 2008. Uh, at the time, the city has a black majority. It's, it's probably about 52 percent. Um, when we started writing the book in, in 2011, that was literally the year that it was announced. The census numbers had come out, and black, the, the D.C. had uh, dipped below a black majority for the first time since 1957. Um, in that time, though, Obama's in office, Trump's in office. What you see is sort of a hyper-gentrification in the city, where the black population is now down to roughly 41 percent in the last census that came out this year. Um, and so that pattern was kind of bipartisan one, uh, where the city was getting richer and whiter and, and primarily poor African Americans uh, were being pushed across the line into Prince George's County. Uh, something, by the way, that Prince George's County leadership has been complaining about since the 80s, right? Um, and so, so, you know, you see this, this sort of, this pattern of a pendulum on the national level but on the local level, you also see something far more complicated, right? And, and that is that there's the, the rise of a sort of pro-business coalition in, in City Hall that wanted to make sure that, that well-to-do people were moving back to the city and didn't make a lot of provision for poor people to stay in the city. And as a result, uh, money just pushed poor people out of the city. African Americans are disproportionately poor in this city, and so when you push poor people out, you're essentially pushing black people out. And so during that time, where we went from Obama to Trump, you had the black population decline by 10 percentage points. And just just to, to add to that, you know, I think, and I see this with many of my students, people, in you know, American students, particularly white Americans, but I think American students have this idea of, of, of linear history, you know, that, that, that history moves in a straight line. Like, oh, it was bad then, but it's better now, right? We, you know, things were so bad then, but look how much better they are now. And like, there's, there's this smooth line of pro progress, right? The arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice, right? You know, this, oh yes, it, it's, we're always moving in the right direction. But that's not how it works, right? In African-American history, the history of race in this country teaches us that. Right? For every step forward, I mean, Reconstruction was a remarkable time in this city and throughout the South. You had, you had two black men elected to the U.S. Senate from Mississippi. Right? You, you, you had a majority of the South Carolina legislature was African-American. You, you had the most progressive racial legislation passed by the D.C. Board of Aldermen. This was remarkable. And then you look 10 years later and all that's stripped away. We have lynching spreading across the South, disenfranchisement, constitutions, reconstruction constitutions being thrown out and rewritten to, to disfranchise black Americans. So things do regress, right? And there are backlashes. And so we constantly have to be aware of that and work to prevent it, to organize and not become complacent and think, oh, we did this. Mm. It's 2016, that can't possibly happen. Oh yes, it can, and it will again if we, if we don't organize and, and work 
consistently towards a, a more just and democratic city and country. Mm. Oh, are they coming up? Thank you. Okay, so we have a question from- Oh wait, hold on, we have one, one, one more from the audience here. <laughs> Are we, are we in the scheme of things? Are we in a backlash? Are we in something that is uh, a lot of people considered a catastrophe in Virginia, but people will come around and rally and keep reforms going forward and make sure that the anti-voting measures that are 400 bills, wherever, won't mm. pass? Mm -hmm. Where are we in that? <laughs> Goodness, I, I wish I knew. Right. We're historians. We look, you know, we look at the past. You know, you can't, can't prophesize about the, the, the future. Yeah, we, we always try to dodge that one. <laughs> I mean, I would say, of course, especially in this time, you know, we, we, we get hyper-focused on, on the issue of the day, whether it's the election in Virginia or, or whatever, you know, and, and try to read the tea leaves and figure out what's going on. You know, I think it's important to step back and look at the, the, the broader movement. And, you know, I think about what... Um, what Stacey Abrams, for example, did in Georgia, and has done in Georgia, right? It's, you know, she is playing the long game, right? And I think that that's what advocates for social justice need to play the long game, not get too fixated on a particular candidate or a particular campaign or a particular loss, but to, to really focus on, on, on building up, uh, you know, new generations of voters, educate people about the process, get people involved, you might lose some here or there, but, but keep building that, that base and keep working that, that base and not giving up. Because, uh, you know, if you look back to when, you know, she, she lost the governor's race and, and that might have been it. She could have just thrown in the towel and be like, oh, you know, this is, this is hopeless. But no, she, she, she saw that as just one more step on the road. And we saw the fruits of that in, in 2020 and perhaps even more so going, going forward. And so... I would say you know, don't let particular defeats drain, you know, drain the movement of hope because you, you need to keep building that pace, base. And, and I'll just I'll add one other point and bring it back to the DC story because I, I think that um, this, is, this has given me a little hope uh, in the last four years. So when we wrote Chocolate City, you know, we sort of looked at the history of the struggle for statehood. And, and you know, <laughs> I sent Chris my, my, my section on, on uh, the chapter I was writing with, with, that covered the statehood struggle from the uh, 1980s. And he says, oh, wow, man, this is about 20 pages too long. How about you cut it out and actually just write a standalone article on statehood? And, and, and I ended up, and I ended up doing that. And Chris <laughs> was the editor of Washington History at the time, and he edited it wonderfully. Um, but what we, what we really came to was that statehood was in 1987, when Walter Fauntroy tried to get a vote out in, in, in the House, and then in 1993, when they actually did get a vote in the House and lost terribly, it was kind of a hopeless cause. And oddly enough, when we published the book, we still felt that that was the case, and so that was, you know, 2017. And then things changed really dramatically. Um, some of the very things that we lament today, uh, the rise of Donald Trump, um, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the Tea Party insurgency that sort of petered out and morphed into Trumpism, um, pushed large numbers of Democrats to believe that um, the Senate was really kind of stacked against them. Because if you look at the, the number of really large states, California, Texas, Florida, New York, they're basically balanced Democrat, Republican, right? Like you count the number of senators, for the top five, top six, it's roughly even. And then you look at the bottom five states in population, Wisconsin, um, uh, I'm sorry, Wyoming, I said Wisconsin, Wyoming, um, uh, New Hampshire, um, Alaska, right? And these are states that have somewhere between, you know, 500,000 and a million residents. And so DC technically is right in the middle of those numbers, right? And the vast majority of the senators from those states Republican, right? And so what you have in the Senate is, is an imbalance, right? If you look at the, the, the number of Senate votes nationwide, it's basically even Democrat and Republican. It's even balanced a little bit towards the Democrats. But if you look at the number of senators, it's balanced quite significantly towards the Republicans, 
right? I mean, the last election just was almost a fluke of major turnout in Georgia because of that remarkable work that Stacey uh, Abrams had done. Um, and so what a lot of Democrats said well, was, we need another small state, right? So we're going to back D.C. statehood. And oh, by the way, it's also just, <laughs> right? And so th there's, there's a way in which, you know, the, these, th this backlash has actually worked in the city's favor. You know, people who said, well, we don't want another small state. You know, we think that California senators should have all the power that they need because we're, we're the biggest. And, um, you know, back in the 90s, they were, they were loath to vote for statehood. But this time around, the California senators are on board. Why? Because they need us, another Democratic state, to actually gain a, a majority in the Senate that's commensurate with the, the basic voting population nationwide, right? And so there's, there's a way in which, you know, you can talk about this sort of national story where you have, you know, uh, uh, things looking pretty bleak. Um, but there's also the other side of it, which is that, you know, there's a large number of people who have swung to DC's side because of this backlash politics out there. Uh, and the hope is that we will find a way to um, very intelligently sort of use that to pursue our own ends. One thing that we have never lacked in this city is really sharp political strategists, Walter Fauntroy, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Marion Barry, right, who Carol Schwartz famously said was a better politician high than most of his colleagues were perfectly sober, right? <laughs> and, you know, and she ran against him, right? Uh, but, but, you know, you look at these people that we've been blessed with as political leaders in this city, and you have to say, like, they have really been able to figure out how to make sure that our interests align with, with sort of a national set of interests so that even though we don't have much power, we can nonetheless get the things we need. And I think that what we really need to double down on uh, right now and in the years ahead are, are making sure that we're carrying that tradition and finding a way to convince Democrats the country over, and maybe even a few Republicans, um, that not only is D.C. statehood just, but it would actually uh, remedy a crisis of legitimacy that we have in the U.S. Senate today, where the number, the number of senators simply don't correspond to the way people are voting out there in the country. Uh, we have um, two um, questions from uh, the audience. So we'll start with the first one from Jefferson Beaker. Jefferson, thank you for sending along. And it says, I've been fascinated by the beginning of the book and your writing about the Native American populations. Uh, can you speak about that and how their original presence would later shade what the city became? Um, yes, absolutely, Jefferson. Um, so th there's no question that uh, the Native American settlement of the entire Chesapeake region uh, influenced uh, the uh, European uh, and African settlement of, of, the, of the region. Um, whether it was the fact that the first uh, European settlement in Maryland was St. Mary's City, which was an abandoned Native American village uh, that local uh, Native American chief actually encouraged uh, the, the um, um, uh, colonists to, to settle. Um, or in this area, uh, you had a situation where um, the, the, the um, uh, Captain John Smith came up here from the Jamestown settlement. Um, and he had really received a, a very hostile uh, reception all up and down the Potomac because the vast majority of Native American uh, tribes or nations that were settled along the, the lower Potomac were uh, aligned with um, uh, uh, Native Americans to the south, the Powhatan Confederacy. And the Powhatan Confederacy had already, by the time that Captain John Smith came up the Potomac uh, in 1608, had already kind of tangled with John Smith and were not that keen to him at that moment, right? He and Powhatan had already butted heads. Um, and so they were very hostile to John Smith. He, he, he writes in his diary, like every time we passed a village, they screamed at us, they threw stuff at us, they shot a couple arrows just to make us a little uncomfortable. Uh, and then we got to Nacochetank, right? Uh, which of course was here, right over at Joint Base, where Joint Base Anacostia Bowling is today. He's like, and they treated us great. They were really nice. And the reason was because uh, the, the people of Nacochetank were trying to stay independent from the Powhatan Confederacy, and Powhatan had been putting pressure on them for years to join his confederacy forcibly. Uh, and so they saw the English as kind of a counterweight to Powhatan. So they said, well, Powhatan doesn't like him. Well, we like him. Uh, and he actually gets a relatively good uh, uh, reception um, from uh, the uh, Nacostan uh, at the time. And so it's both the sort of geography that Native Americans have created in the area that, that end up influencing settlement, 
uh, but it's also the, the, the politics of Native Americans, Native Americans in the area that influence um, the reception that, that colonists are getting uh, once they land here and once they move around the Chesapeake. Chris, we have a, a sure, we have another question here from building off that last one, which was, was there any interaction and or solidarity mm. between the Native Americans and the enslaved population in this, in this area? Uh, and it's, it's hard, <laughs> you know, I think sometimes we, we might want to see certain things like, oh, it, wouldn't it make sense for the enslaved population and the Native Americans to, to have solid, be solid, you know, work in solidarity against the, the white plantation owners? That doesn't really happen all that much. And in, in part, it's just a matter of power, right? Just like the relationships uh, among the tribes, you know, a lot of the tribes look at the English and see that they, they have guns and they, you know, they have these ships and they, they want to eat, make friends or they want to, to be, you know, but it's a, it's a matter of power. The enslaved population doesn't have any power. I mean, the native tribes aren't gonna gain a whole lot by allying themselves with, with enslaved populations. Uh, the, the slave populations are still small in the era, in, in the 1600s, when, when there's the, the most kind of I interaction and clashing between white settlers and, uh, and Native American tribes. By the 1700s, as slave society really starts to take root, it takes root because the Native Americans have been pushed out, and they've been pushed further and further west, or just wiped out all, entirely. And so this land is now cleared for cash crop agriculture, right? tobacco farming, essentially, where, where enslaved populations can go. And so while you do see uh, individual slaves may run away and find a maroon community or, or uh, find a tribe that's willing to take them in, that doesn't happen that much in this area. You'll see it much more so down south, in Georgia and Florida, uh, where the, the Seminole tribe is, is very actively recruiting enslaved people to, to run away and join them, but that happens much, much less so around here. And I know we've gone way over your time. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm gonna, thank you, Eric. I'm gonna just go out on a limb and say, I'll just speak for myself. I didn't mind that you went over time. Thank you so much. This is a dynamic duo. What a gift it's been to receive what you thank brought you. to us tonight. Thank you so much. Um, and again, um, thanks everyone for being here. We have had over 85 people, at least at the last count I got, um, joining us online just this evening. And so it's, we, we've had a beautiful, um, very full experience. If you have a book that you would like to have signed, we're gonna invite you to, uh, to do that now. And you'll have a chance to say hello to, uh, to our authors. And you'll go out these doors and then some ushers, some Folks will be there to help, find, help you find your way, and we will meet you there. Um, thank you all so much for being here, and again, thank you to everyone who's made this possible. Thank you for your brilliance, and um, this was just fantastic. Um, so um, we do hope that we'll see you again at, at future events here at Foundry, and thanks again for being with us tonight. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>